Welcome to Trivia, the sixth of 14 live sessions. Thanks for coming tonight. Well, so tonight we have there are the sixth of 14 sessions on both YouTube and Facebook that are part of the Digital 2021 Wyoming Outdoor Expo brought to you by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And especially tonight, many of our partners. Depending on the questions you choose, you may hear from the National Bighorn Sheep Center in Dubois, the Werner Wildlife Museum in Casper, game wardens from across the state who are members of the Wyoming Game Warden Association, the Wyoming chapter of Trout Unlimited, the Wyoming Geological Survey, or Smoky Bear in the State Forestry Division. Tonight, don't get too far away from your keyboard. This game relies on you to choose categories and questions and show off your Wyoming cred. To get started, jump in that comment bar and let us know where you're watching from. Your hosts for tonight's game are Will Schultz, one of our wildlife biologists, and Melissa Robel, our outreach event coordinator. Will <laughs> and Melissa? It's all yours. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So we're here to play trivia with you guys tonight. So hopefully you guys are excited. I know I am. I don't it's know about be a you. Lot of fun. It's gonna be a lot of fun. That's for sure. Um, we would love to hear where you're joining in from, and anyone can comment. Yeah. And uh, it seems like we have a whole variety already. So thanks wow. so much, even from Texas, and that's yeah. awesome. So we're gonna get started with trivia. And so how this is going to work is we're going to have five categories for you guys to play with. Um, again, my name is Melissa. This is Will. I'm the wildlife biologist for our wildlife division here in Cheyenne. Awesome. And so we have five categories tonight. We have getting schooled, mystery madness, other Wyoming wildlife, ask a game warden, and Wyoming big game. And how this is going to work is you're going to pick a category and a value, and whoever comments first, we're going to do that question. Does that make sense to you, Will? I think so. Okay, yeah. so yeah. let's go ahead and get started. So choose a category and comment a value so we can start this game going. we got to have some, some folks that know their Wyoming trivia, I <laughs> hope, out there. Yeah, I hope so, too. Do you know about the getting schooled category, Will? Well, I'm thinking maybe it has something to do with fishing. That's probably true. So for the getting schooled category, um, we did uh, over eight. We did eight different types of booth boxes for Expo at Home, uh, Expo at School. And for Expo at School, we reached over 3,500 students across Wyoming to learn about uh, Wyoming wildlife. Isn't that amazing? It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was amazing, but a lot of work. Okay, so we got our first question that we're going to do. Thanks, Lisa and Stevie um, from YouTube. It's Mystery Madness for 500. We're starting big tonight. Wow. All <laughs> right. All right. Here we go. Okay, Mystery Madness 500. What are other wildland hazards that you should be aware of after a wildfire? So if you know or you want to take a guess, any guess is completely fine. Uh, just comment below and we'll see if you have the correct answer. There is actually more than one answer for this question, there Will. Is. Yeah, there's a, there's a few things out there that can be pose a hazard after a, a wildfire. How much do you know about wildfires uh, for the work that you do? Yeah, so, you know, I am uh, used to be a field biologist and, and used to work with some of the land management agencies for uh, trying to do rehab and, and to uh, minimize invasive species after a wildfire. So a little bit of experience. Okay, you're more experienced than me, that's for sure. Well, it seems like we got some good answers already. We have tree fall by Don. Okay. We have some mudslides by Bill on YouTube. Thanks for commenting. Ash from Lisa and Stevie, Fallen Trees. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of great, great answers out there. Yeah, let's so. see if any of them are correct, okay. right, Will? Okay. Okay, so the answer is falling trees, falling dead trees, flash flooding, stump holes, erosion, and mudslides. And this question is actually put on by the Wyoming State Forestry Division. So thanks to them and partnering with us for trivia for this Absolutely. expo event. 
Great. So what's a, what's our next next topic here that we're going to I'm not sure. So you guys have to comment and let us know. I mean, we yeah. already tried uh, Mystery Madness, so we're okay. going to have to try some other categories maybe. So it looks like, um, yeah, let's, that next one under. Oh, we have a oh, yeah. big game for 400. Let's yeah. pick that. We're still going big here, so <laughs> people are confident in their yeah. Wyoming facts here. Don wants to uh, try that one on, so. All right, so Wyoming big game for 400. How do bighorn sheep rams bash their heads together during dominance battles without breaking their skulls? Mm. That's that's a very good question. <laughs> so what do we have? Anybody who wants to take a a stab at that for us and and what what do you think the answer is? Yeah, comment below. I want to hear what you think. Yeah. I know if I uh, hit my head all the time, I would definitely uh, break my skull, so right, it would not right. be good at all. They don't. You know, they'll do that time and time again and, uh, you know, don't even look the least bit dazed. Yeah, so. it's crazy to watch. Have you ever seen uh, Bighorn here in Wyoming? You know, I have. And uh, the first time um, I actually heard it first, and then started looking around and actually saw the sheep up in the rocks. But it, it was just an incredible sound. And, and I mean, just as loud as a, a baseball. Oh, uh, man. A ball. So pretty neat. Yeah, I haven't been lucky enough to see it. But hopefully you guys joining us tonight have. So we do have a lot of answers, which is amazing. We have insane skull plates from Shane on Facebook. Skull design from Buck. Okay. And uh, honeycomb skulls by Terry on Facebook. So it seems like you guys Some have pretty pretty good responses. I think. I think they are yeah. almost experts here of Wyoming wildlife. So Absolutely. let's see the answer. So actually, we have an answer from Karen Sullivan from the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Known for their dominance battles, which you can see on the mountain, kind of above my head, behind me. Uh, during the fall, rams will run at each other up to 30 miles per hour and bash their heads together. And they could do this for hours. Uh, the winner of the dominance battle gets to mate with the ewes that are in the area. So how do they have these amazing battles without cracking their skull or causing some type of brain injury? Well, they have several adaptations that help with this. So one is they have these sutures in their skull um, which we do too, but their sutures or joints, they don't fuse together as tightly as ours do in our skull. Um, so there's a little bit of give or a little bit of shock absorbing ability because those sutures aren't um, joined together as tightly. And in addition to that, if we look inside their skull, they actually have two layers of bone that make up their skull. You can see right here. And in between those two layers of bone are these bony struts and air pockets. So again, that acts like a shock absor absorber and absorbs the impact from those head bashing events. Now, in addition to that, a bighorn sheep horn fits over this bony core um, from their skull. And inside that bony core, um, there are also air pockets, which you can see in this bony core that was cut off of a younger ram. Um, you see the air pockets inside and the bony struts. So that's even more um, shock absorbing ability. So bighorn sheep ram um, skulls are very well adapted for these dominance battles that they have each fall to determine mating rights. Awesome. Thanks again, Karen, for doing that video for us. Uh, that explains it pretty well, don't you think? Absolutely. And, and a lot of the viewers were spot on in, in their responses there. So thank you very much. Yeah, great job. Uh, keep commenting, though, if you have any comments on any questions or if you just want to learn more, you know, let us know. Absolutely. So let's see what next question you guys want to do. I don't know if we're going to pick a new category yeah. or maybe a bit of the same. Um, I believe, uh, yeah, Marty's got. Oh, yeah, there. he does. Yeah, so ask a game warden for 200. We haven't done that category yet. Okay. So ask a game warden for 200. What do I do if I find newborn or abandoned wildlife? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question, especially this time of the year. Soon we're going to have little baby fawns and birds and, and across the landscape. 
because it's that time of the year. And so it's a great uh, question to ask and, and, and find out what the right response is. Yeah, so let us know what you think you should do. Um, I'm really curious. And, you know, Will is right. It's being about springtime. You know, I always joke here in Wyoming, spring doesn't start for a little bit later, but that's totally okay. Yeah, it looks like we've got some answers coming in. Leave it alone. Uh, leave it alone. <laughs> leave it alone. Leave it alone. Uh, call a game, game and fish. So, yeah, those, those seem like some, some pretty good responses. Um, yeah, should we see? Yeah, we might as well see okay. the answer. We're yeah, pretty uh, unified right here. Hi, my name is Kristen DeBannon. I'm a game warden with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and also a member of the Wyoming Game Wardens Association. If at any point in time you do think that a newborn animal is truly abandoned, orphaned, or injured, you can call your local game warden or your local wildlife biologist, and we would be happy to go out and check on that animal. Otherwise, Leave it at where it is, stay a safe distance away, observe, take pictures, and enjoy what nature has to offer. Awesome. That's Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thanks from the Wyoming Game Warden Association. I really appreciate them putting together that video. Um, and, you know, and a good thing to keep in mind, Will, is if you ever have a question, you can always call your local game warden. Absolutely. Yeah. Kristen was, again, spot on with her response there. Um, you know, just leave it alone. If, if it's truly abandoned, for example, um, you, you know, there's a fawn laying alongside the road and there's a, uh, obviously a dead deer there. You know, pretty, that's probably a situation where you need to get a hold of us and we can, we can take care of that situation. But in most cases, if you're out and about and you stumble across a fawn or something, more than likely it is not abandoned. So just leave it alone and, and enjoy the, the moment. So. Definitely. Okay, it seems like Jennifer is completely on top of it and is ready to go for the next question. All right. So let's do it. So she said wildlife for 300, which, so we'll go with other Wyoming wildlife. Okay. So bobcats, mountain lions, and blank are the three wild felines native to Wyoming. Okay. Yeah, so what, what are we missing here, folks? What's, what's that third native feline? of Wyoming? That's the question. I, it can be kind of a tough question, you know, because I don't There's, think we see it that much, you know, yeah. here in Wyoming. Most wild cats are, are very elusive. And, uh, and there's also, there's different nicknames and so forth for them. So, um, yeah. So we'll see what we get for some, some responses. So seems like a lot of people think <laughs> may know the answer. It's yeah. very similar. So yeah, I, I think we, I think we got some answers there. So yeah, let's, let's see if everyone's correct. Canada lynx. Canada lynx. Yeah. So yeah, most people would just call them uh, uh, a lynx, but technically their name is the Canada lynx. Okay. So, thanks for that distinction. Yeah, not, Will. not Canadian. Because they're from Wyoming. Right? Okay. Yeah, right? we can't call them Canadians here. Yeah, they're, they're Canada. <laughs> All right. So um, what's our what's the next question? Yeah, I'm not sure if we have another question that we want us to do yet. And uh, somebody please please uh, pick a category and a and a point amount here. Yeah, let's get started with the next one. It seems like you guys are really know your links. That's for sure. <laughs> Mystery for 100. Okay. What is the Wyoming State Gemstone? So when I was putting together this question, Will, I actually really didn't know it before. So yeah. I even learned when I was putting well, it and, together. And there's, there's, you know, there's potential for, um, you know, any of those, those four uh, possibilities. You know, they, they have been found here in Wyoming. So. Yeah. So the four options are jade, opal, Ruby and diamond. So it seems like. Yeah, so we've got a, hopefully we've got some rock hounds <laughs> in, in our audience or geologists that uh, can uh, can take a stab at this. So, yeah. It oh, seems definitely. Like... There's, so we've got some answers rolling in. Now. Yeah, it seems like people are pretty confident yeah, in their answers. I think so, so let's see if they're all correct. Okay. It is Jade. And we'll do it from our answers from Aaron Campbell with the state 
She's a state ge geologist with the Wyoming State Geological Survey. The Wyoming State Gemstone is jade, but not just any jade. Wyoming jade is made of a mineral called nephrite, which makes it some of the best jade in the world. It's extremely hard, but easy to cut and very durable. And it can be found in lots of beautiful colors, such as black and white, or this apple green. It's found primarily in central Wyoming, and it's been found from Thermopolis south to the Sierra Madre Mountains, and from the Wind River Range east to the Laramie Range. This boulder of jade that we have in the office of the Wyoming State Geological Survey weighs 218 pounds. It was found outside of Jeffrey City in the 1940s. Awesome. And it's really cool that your dad is a geologist, so no wonder you know the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> you better know it. So oh, man. I, didn't, I didn't realize that jade came in so many different colors. Yeah, I did not know that either, but it was a really cool thing to learn. I've probably walked by it several times. <laughs> I think it was jade. So. Okay. Yeah. So we're back to our game board. Um, choose a category and a question. And if you comment first, we'll pick you. So yeah. go ahead and uh, let Who's us next? know. I think we haven't really tried a getting schooled question yet, Will. I don't think we have either. Um, but it looks like uh, looks like we got a couple rolling in now. So it looks like Bill's interested in uh, ask okay. ask a game warden for five hundred. Five hundred. Okay. Going big, you know. Okay. So ask a game warden 500, what causes antler deformities? Mm. There's, there's a, a few different responses out there that are going to be correct. Mm -hmm. So let's see, uh, see what folks there at home have for us for a response to that question. Yeah, I would love to hear what you guys think. Um, it is an mm -hmm. interesting thing if you see it. it. And there's, and already we're getting a, a variety of, of responses, uh, genetics, DNA, nutrition. Wow. So, <laughs> a little bit of everything, yeah, you think? Broke off. <laughs> injury. That could happen. Yeah. So, so, so some, some pretty good uh, responses for that question. So um, let's go ahead and see what we've got for uh, an answer for folks. Yeah. Hi, my name is Teal Kavad, and I'm the president of the Association. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about antler abnormalities and deformities. When we talk about antler deformities, we can typically break them into a couple different categories. The first being non-injury induced antler deformities or abnormalities, and the second being injury induced. The first kind of antler abnormality that I'm going to talk about are those non-injury induced abnormalities or un unusual antler formations. With this particular buck, you can see he's got this kind of interesting point coming off his main being there. He's got this point here and also this point here. Pretty unusual, not what we would call a typical antler formation. For this buck, this may be related to genetics. Oftentimes, if you see multiple bucks in one localized area with similar unusual antler formations, that could be chalked up to genetic predisposition for those antlers. The second category of antler deformities I'm going to talk about are injury-induced antler deformities. The injuries that often cause antler deformities that we see in the field are injuries to the pedicle. The pedicle is the bony protrusion from the frontal bone on the skull that the antler grows from. And if we have injury to the pedicle, we often see that bucks have that antler deformity that persists throughout their life. The other kinds of injuries that we often see that can cause antler deformities are injuries to the velvet or the antler while it's in velvet. Velvet is a fuzzy or furry looking membrane that covers the antler for a good portion of late spring, summer, and early fall. This membrane protects the, the antler as it's growing prior to calcifying and supplies it with nutrients and blood. If there's an antler that receives an injury to the velvet, oftentimes that injury will only persist through that year. And once those antlers are shed, the buck oftentimes can grow a normal looking antler in the subsequent year. This antler here may have been an injury to the velvet or even the pedicle. You can see the base or the burr of this, this antler is kind of interesting looking. So that might indicate that there is some sort of injury that was related to the pedicle for this year of growth for this antler. 
also this is an unusual antler because it's got this palmation or this flattening of the of the main beam or the main tines and that may also be related to some sort of injury while this this antler was in velvet there could also be some genetics at play here and that's why determining what causes antler abnormalities is oftentimes difficult because there can be some confounding circumstances that cause these bumpy looking antlers Thanks again, Teal, from the Wyoming Game Warden Association. That was a great explanation. It was, As you yeah. can tell, it's a little bit of everything, right, Will? It is, yeah. And, and that was something uh, when I was a field biologist in the in the wintertime when we we're doing our classification counts. And, and almost every year you would see some incredibly unusual deer out there on the landscape or or when we were uh, checking the hunters in the in the fall. Um, and, and those things are you know, for the hunters that bag those those animals, it's pretty special. Definitely, so, yeah. yeah. Well, that's something to look out for if you guys are out in the field and, you know, see that. Now you know how that happens. Yeah, and thanks for the responses. Uh, it looks like everybody, you know, just, you know, have you, your your knowledge of uh, – Wyoming outdoor trivia is, is really good. <laughs> Fantastic. So, you blow us out of the water. Yeah. So. <laughs> thanks for, yeah. thanks so, for joining us. Yeah. You know, so, we could probably learn from you as I, well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I have. Uh, for example, there was uh, one of the responses included insects. And it did remind me that uh, there are uh, abnormalities with antler development that have been contributed to insects. So, you know, that are bothering those animals when, when they're in that, that, uh, that formation stage. So um, nice job, everyone. Yeah, good so, job. So what, uh, what's our next category? It looks like. Uh, uh, Seems like getting, getting school. Okay. okay, let's start that category. Yeah, let's do that. We're hitting 500. all the 500s here. Yeah. Boy, I guess it's big. go big or go home, right? That's the thing. So... Okay. Getting schooled for 500. What fish has a humpback, a blunt snout, a long dorsal, and rounded tail? Uh, I think this is going to stump a few folks out there. So we're going to find out who our fish experts are. Okay. So. Let's see. It's definitely not me, Will. I don't yeah. know about you. So I'm a wildlife guy. So <laughs> I like to eat fish. Okay. That's yeah. a good response. I like to eat fish, too. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not very good at catching them. Oh, so. uh, yeah. But it's just going out and yeah. hanging out with everyone. So that's oh, really absolutely. the fantastic yeah. part of fishing. So oh, we have some questions. Oh, wow. Questions. We've got a lot of different answers here. We've got... Uh, we may have stumped them, so yeah. that's good. Rainbow trout, <laughs> buffalo, uh, Wyoming chub, Ooh. humpback chub, and uh, I can't tell what that I don't is. know. Uh, uh, grayling. 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 So, yeah, many of these <laughs> responses, they have like one or two of those features, mm -hmm. but not the whole package. That's the so. thing. I don't think we've quite seen the right answer yet. Yeah. So maybe we'll, uh, you know, wait a couple more minutes and see yeah. if people start to catch on and think a little bit harder about what this potentially yeah. could be. Have you ever seen this fish here in Wyoming? You know, I haven't. I okay. Know. Like I said, I'm I'm not very good at catching. So. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Well, I think okay. we do have the right answer in there. So let's move on let's and see. It. So the answer is the freshwater drum. So right. good job yeah. for TJ on Facebook. Congrats. Oh, on Alexis had that too. Oh, so, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, Alexis yeah, yeah. too. Awesome. Shout out to you. I mean, I really like drums. I don't know about you, Will, because they're really fun. They make that drumming sound. Okay, that's right. And so yeah. it's really unique, and you you can catch a drum. And when I've caught a drum, I've actually not a caught a drum here in Wyoming, but when I've caught a drum somewhere else, and you hear that sound, and it goes off of their air bladder and stuff like that, it's so cool and it's magical, mm -hmm. and it doesn't you know it doesn't seem real yeah. really. <laughs> like why is this fish making this sound within Def it? Definitely but unusual. <laughs> definitely. So let's see what other category we want to do and okay. what value. Oh, you've caught one out at Gray Rocks. That's oh, really, really cool. Okay. I haven't been there, but that sounds fun. Not too far away. Awesome. Yeah. So, okay. It looks like uh, we've got, um, looks like somebody wants, um, what was, what was that one again? 
think it was uh, Chris, uh, big game for 200 big game for 200 yeah yeah we haven't uh, really gotten into that category either so Wyoming big game 200 because many does have horns how can I tell the difference between a doe pronghorn and a yearling buck pronghorn yeah. when I have a doe fawn pronghorn license? Yeah, that's that's a, a great question and and one that uh, kind of is it makes folks a little nervous when they're they're hunting uh, pronghorn and and they've got a, a, a doe fawn license and and uh, it it can be really difficult sorting out those younger bucks. Yeah, you really have yeah. to be careful, you know, yeah. and uh, really yeah, so, identify as much as you can. Yeah. So what's so what's it looks like? Oh, we've already got a bunch of folks that are telling us uh, what kind of features we should look for, and and uh, there's there's a there's one that's that's kind of true, uh, and and usually uh, helps in identifying those males, and and it looks like a lot of folks are. Uh, I got that figured out. But yeah, they might be uh, hunting pronghorn yeah, a lot. So, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> pretty confident yeah. here. Well, it's one of those things when you spend some time in the field, it it, it becomes pretty easy to spot. Mm -hmm. And once you know what you're looking for and where to look for it, um, is is really going to help you out. So let's see the answer to that. I'm Brady Fruit, the Latter Game Warden with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, a member of the Wyoming Game Wardens Association. One issue I see every year during the antelope season is when people with doe fawn antelope licenses mistakenly take yearling bucks. While it's true that many does have horns and they're about the same size as a yearling bucks, one thing they lack is the black cheek patch. All bucks have a black cheek patch at the back of the jaw right below the eye. Does don't have that black cheek patch. Now on yearling bucks, it can be a little bit faint or if you're in low light conditions, or looking from a long ways away, you not, might not be able to see it. So it's important that you know your target before you shoot. The Game and Fish Department wants you to have a safe and enjoyable hunting season. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, definitely that black cheek patch is a mm -hmm. really good indicator. Yeah, and as, as Brady indicated on, on younger animals, it, it may be smaller or, or you know, but it will definitely be there. And, you know, and if the animal's too far away, you know, the heat waves are making it a little <laughs> difficult to see yeah. and so forth through your binoculars, get closer. You know, that's that's the best thing is always uh, make sure that you know what you're shooting at. That's definitely true. I can't agree more with you, Will. Um, okay. So what is our next Trivia category, folks, and and uh, in let's, value, let's yeah. see. So we hit yeah. a lot of those five hundreds, right, but we right. still have a lot of those four hundreds left. Yeah, so actually, we do have a couple five hundreds oh, left. Oh, it looks like we've got other wildlife for I believe three hundred. Three hundred. Okay, let's go for it. Oh, I think we already did this question. Okay, yeah. Sorry, folks, that we don't have a way of of indicating which ones on on that board. It's just um, a test if you're paying attention, yeah, right, Will? So exactly. <laughs> if you yeah. say you don't watch this the whole right. time, so, then you might recognize that question. But next to that, uh, it looks like TJ's interested in big game for 400. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And, oh, I think we did that as well. <laughs> okay, we've still got a lot of questions, though. So Sorry about so, that, uh, folks. How about, how about TJ, what do you think of big game for 300? Yeah, let's try that. It seems like TJ likes the big game. So. Okay. Okay, Wyoming big game, 300. How can horns be used to determine the age of a bighorn sheep ram? Yeah, that's that's pretty neat. Uh, you know, we're going to we're going to learn a little something here that I think I think most folks would figure out. Um, but uh, it, it is kind of a, a neat way for biologists in the field uh, to to have an idea of, of what age class and potentially even what year, you know, right down to the year of when that animal was uh, born. So. Um, oh, it seems like, oh, we have a bunch of the okay. rings. Yeah. Annual growth rings. Okay. And you have some experience with bighorn, don't you? I have a little bit of experience. Yeah. I've, I've uh, helped manage a few herds over the years. I, uh, helped with uh, translocations of bighorns uh, across this state and others. And so, yeah, 
really a majestic animal. Yeah. Uh, one that, uh, you, you know, I think anytime you ever have an opportunity to encounter bighorns, it's, it's just unforgettable and it will certainly make that outdoor experience uh, something to remember. Definitely. Okay, let's see if our uh, answers are correct. Mm -hmm. And this is also by Karen Sullivan with the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Thanks again for the second video answer. Really appreciate it. Hi. So there are a couple of ways that you can estimate the age of a bighorn sheep ram. Uh, the easiest way is using their horns. So since bighorn sheep horns grow their whole life and they're not shed every year like antlers are, we can use those horns to estimate how old a ram is. And we do that by counting these annuli rings on their horns. Well, these are the dark, deep rings that you can see here and here. That dark, deep, small ring represents that horn growth in the fall and winter when the animals aren't eating as much, so the horns aren't growing as much. Uh, there's also a hormonal sh uh, shift at that time of the year, so there's less horn growth. Um, in between the dark annuli rings, this light colored area, that represents the growth in the spring and summer when the sheep are eating a lot, so their horns are growing pretty quickly. So if we count just the dark annuli rings um, on this sheep's horn, um, this animal was probably one, two, three, maybe about four years old. So that's a pretty young sheep. The average age of a bighorn sheep ram is about 12 years. So that one was fairly young. Here's the horn from a little bit older um, sheep. So if we count the rings on this horn, this animal was probably one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven or eight years old. Um, so that was a little bit older and probably at its prime when this animal died. So thanks for tuning in. And now you know how to age a bighorn sheep ram. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that was really perfect information. Thank you very much. Is there anything yeah. you would like to add to that? You, you know, know one of the things that last horn that she was showing us, you could see uh, that it, it didn't come to a point. It was, mm -hmm. it was what we call broomed off. And, and a lot of times it'll almost be uh, slivery and so forth on the end. And, and that's where while they're, they're doing those battles and, and butting heads, that those tips, and we call them lamb tips, get busted back. And so sometimes you won't even be able to see those first couple of annual, uh, annual rings uh, because they're gone. Oh, um, wow. So, uh, yeah, that was a phenomenal specimen of a horn there. So Super bonus fun fact here. Thanks yeah. to Will. So, yeah, uh, so it looks like, uh, 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 oh, we've got, we had one for Mystery Madness for 100, but we've already taken that one. So I'm sorry. Uh, so let's, how about, we've got another one for Mystery Madness for 200. Okay. So, yeah. That sounds good to me. Let's do that. Okay. Mystery Madness for 200. Why does Game and Fish ask hunters to send in big game tooth samples? Hmm. Yeah, there's there's a few different reasons for that. So Don't give away the answer no, too much, no, Will. No, okay. Know, <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for taking the chat. So. You know, we have to wait and see what people right, want to right, do. Right. So, yeah. But, you know, well, you could What would hit. be one reason, folks, that uh, we might want you to submit uh, big game teeth to us? I want to hear what you guys think. But what's the way that we can like tease the answer well, yeah. but not quite give it away? Is there any uh, information let's, there? Let's or? see. Um, well, um, you know, if we had those teeth, what could we tell about the animal? Mm, I don't know. I mean, don't animals have certain types of teeth for mm -hmm. certain? They do, but, but there's something that, similar to what we just talked about with the bighorn sheep mm. that it would allow us to know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's a good hint yeah, right so. there. Thanks. Oh, Will. oh, I think I'm seeing, a few <laughs> things. seeing a couple of things that, uh, Jerry picked up some, on your hints yeah, there. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and see what the answer to this is. All right. Hi, my name is Molly and I am the tooth aging coordinator at the Wyoming wildlife forensic and fish health lab. Tooth aging provides important information about the demographics of Wyoming's big game herds. This information is also used by biologists when they are studying hunting seasons each year. This is a jaw of a bull elk that was aged at six and a half years. 
And so we asked hunters to send in the first two incisors of their big game animals so that we can age them using a technique called the cementum annui analysis. And if you're familiar with counting tree rings, that is also similar to what cementum annui analysis is. So in this photo, this is a, a moose tooth. You can see the blue lines that are the annuli that have been deposited along with the cementum that's kind of in between the annuli each year that that animal um, has been alive. So we count those annuli looking at the tooth under a microscope and then provide a final age based on the eruption date of those incisors. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Molly, for that response. And and uh, you know, uh, wildlife managers use that information when they're determining how much uh, harvest pressure, for example, is is going on out there. And generally, uh, uh, a population where if we're getting a lot of older teeth mm -hmm. submitted to us in the harvest, it means that uh, you know generally we're being pretty conservative with the management, and those animals are allowed to to live longer. Um, and and uh, if uh, if it's mostly younger animals, two, three, four years old, um, then it's telling us that, you know, we probably are providing quite a bit of opportunity. And depending on where our management objective is, we may, uh, uh, you know, recalibrate our, our harvest allocation. And, uh, and that's something that, you know, is, is really t gives us a better idea of, of where those animals are um, looking at antler growth you can have phenomenal bull elk at mm -hmm. five six seven eight yeah, years old definitely. and so if we want to really get down in the weeds and figure out what our average ages are and so forth we need those teeth and so if if you're asked to submit teeth um you, you know if we send you an, an envelope or something really appreciate it if you harvest something if you can get those submitted and uh your, the results of, of the tooth aging that Molly does there is typically uh, available by the, the following early summer. And it is, we're posting the results on our website and you can use your uh, license information and so forth to, to look up those results. Yeah, sounds good. And so now we're gonna move on to uh, other wildlife for 400. I really like this question. Yeah. I think they're adorable, Will. I don't know about yeah. you, but uh, why is the American pika often called the farmer? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think we're going to have some some pretty good answers for this. Let's let's see what folks out there. Let's see what your answers are. We're we're really interested in yeah, definitely the farmer, not the, <laughs> not the rancher. But no, the not the farmer. It's okay. a key difference there. Okay. We don't want to get into not the gardener. <laughs> Right. No, definitely okay. not. Yeah. So, okay, we've got got one here. It says uh, stores its food. Um, they plant seeds. Hmm. Uh, they cache. Uh, what, That's an interesting. Do you, do you answer. know what that means? When, when animal, you like store it for later, yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah, like a squirrel that yeah. takes nuts and berries. <laughs> kind of what I do with chocolate or right, something, you know? Right. Yeah. I've been, <laughs> I've been in your office. So. <laughs> All right. Well, it seems like they have a bunch of okay. answers, so let's that, check it out. Let's do it. Okay, and uh, this is during a single okay. brief high altitude summer. A single pika will make over 14,000 foraging trips to collect forbs and tough alpine grass. Each piece of vegetation is carefully laid across boulders to dry in the sun. Once the crop is cured, the farmer stashes it under rocks and stacks that may be two feet deep weigh 60 pounds, and cover up to 100 square meters. With the food supply in place and a good thick fur coat on its back, the pika is set to hole up in its den and enjoy a hibernation-free winter. Awesome. So I didn't have a chance to mention it before, but thanks, India Hayford from the Werner Wildlife Museum. She put together yeah, that awesome video. Much answer so uh, pretty amazing when you think about how much work they do <laughs> yeah uh, they're so it. small absolutely so. so yeah and and uh hopefully everyone's gotten a chance to uh have seen these guys out there in the wild you're typically going to be at pretty high elevation if that's you right to see one of them 
Okay, so what's uh, what's our next category, folks? Yeah, where, we do, have where do we want to go? A now? lot of questions left, and mm -hmm. uh, we're slowly not, running out of time. So. Not many in the getting schooled. I think that's true. I think we have more wildlife uh, trivia nuts out there than we do fish. Oh, see, folks. now we have a question okay, from getting okay. schooled. So right. don't speak too yeah, soon, yeah. Will. Okay, so uh, Jackie wants schooled, getting schooled for three hundred. Okay. okay. Okay, getting schooled for three hundred. Raising what two species garnered national recognition for the game and fish hatchery program? Hmm. Yeah. Two species, I'm assuming, of, of fish, right? <laughs> That's right, in the yeah. getting schooled category yeah. <laughs> here tonight. Right. Yeah, so we're talking about fish, folks. Um, but we, you know, we do... Uh, um, we do have, I believe, at one time we had Wyoming toads at one of our hatcheries, oh, too. Oh, so. I didn't know that. And, so and that's a fun uh, fact. National Fish Hatchery over in Saratoga <laughs> that's actually operated by Fish and Wildlife Service at, still continues to raise the endangered Wyoming toad there. So so there could be other species. Than okay. Fish. Yeah. I was not sure about that, okay. but uh, you corrected me. So, yeah, we've got, wow, we've got a. Whole We've bunch of Kokanee, answers. Golden trout, tiger trout, snake river cutthroat, wow. Yellowstone cutthroat. Yeah. Okay. Thanks you guys for commenting. I really yeah. appreciate it. Boy, you, know? you get they so <laughs> these folks know their fish. For That's sure. for sure more than yeah. me. So. <laughs> so let's see what the response is. Okay. So the answer is kokanee salmon go. and golden trout. So one thing, if you really want to learn more about our kokanee salmon program, is we have a Keeping Up with Kokanee uh, program for Expo Live on Saturday. And it's going to be from 10.30 a.m. to 11.15. So make sure to check that out. Okay. Um, it's a good way to learn. And we're directly connecting you with the people that work in the hatchery. So you get uh, an exclusive behind-the-scenes yeah. kind of uh, look at that program. Yeah, and, and obviously uh, our Wyoming Game and Fish Hatchery program does a phenomenal job of raising those species. Definitely. Okay, so what's next here, folks? Oh, it seems like we're doing getting schooled for 400. All right, all right. True or false, anyone over 14 needs a fishing license to fish every day in Wyoming. So there's some key words in this true yeah. or false that you yeah, have. They can is, be really tricky, you this know. This is like those exam questions I had on my <laughs> fisheries finals. I think. Fisheries yeah. finals. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, bringing yeah. back yeah. Yeah, some, <laughs> some some bittersweet memories. Oh, so. okay, <laughs> that's for sure. We have yeah. a couple of answers, but we'll see if uh, we get a couple more. True. We got false. We got <laughs> another false, and we got a true. Yeah. So. Uh, false, 12 years of age. Mm. Mm, okay. okay. We'll We're getting specific here. That's a good yeah, point yeah. to make. Free fishing day. Oh, that's mm. exciting. Oops. Not every day. Yeah. So, well, folks, let's take a look and see what the answer is. Yeah, definitely. False. So we do have a free fishing day. Thanks to, like, Alexis on Facebook who got that answer and some other uh, people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the free fishing day is the first Saturday in June, and anyone can fish for free anywhere mm -hmm. except uh, the Wind River Reservation and in, you know, a national park. Yeah. So there's a, a couple of places, but, you know, there's there's great fishing everywhere. Yeah, so. definitely. So dig, definitely take advantage of that day. Absolutely. So uh, hopefully yeah. it's nice weather and right. we can all get outside and yeah. get fishing and, together. You so. know, if you know somebody that, you know, they, they're not sure if they want to buy a license or whatever, hey, take, Perfect take, time. take them fishing, <laughs> get them hooked. Yeah, that's definitely the strategy to do. No pun intended. No pun that. intended. Yeah, right. yeah, you're not about the puns at all. all so. Right. <laughs> Okay, so let's we're back to our categories. Okay. So uh, let's yeah. see. We do actually. We don't have that many questions yeah. left. We might be able to finish it. I'm surprised. Oh, great. Looks like uh, for the. Uh, oh, minute. we get to choose. Oh. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. Well, do you have a well, question? Well, I'll tell you what. I will. I will give you a value of five hundred. Okay. And you, you've got a couple of 
different categories left to pick. So pick one of those. Okay. I think I'm going to go with Mystery Madness. Okay. All right. Let's see. What... Oh, we already did that question. Oh, Just gosh. kidding. <laughs> We're the worst see. at this. Um, okay. You got a couple do... more. So. Uh, that is true. I'm trying to yeah. remember if we already that did was, those ones. That was ones like too. the first question. <laughs> I know I we're we're really one, so. we need to pay more attention here. Well, how about how about other Wyoming wildlife? Let's go with that one. Yeah. Let's see if we've it's done that one. Fun. Oh, we so, have not done this one. That's yeah. good. All right, folks. Okay, other Wyoming wildlife for 500. Which rattlesnakes are found in Wyoming? This is kind of a tough question. Um, is that big ones and small ones, or? <laughs> I think we're looking for species, oh, Will. Okay, okay. okay. so, uh, right. and uh, I don't know about you, but have you ever ran across a rattlesnake you know, in Wyoming? No, usually when I least expect it. Uh, that's, that's usually that's the usually case. usually when you see them. Yeah, so so we've got uh, got some, some uh, responses here like diamondback, prairie, pygmy, prairie, midget, faded, Ooh, mm. so that's we're getting pretty specific. I think that's here, good. So. They know their rattlesnakes. Yeah. It's good. You got to know your snakes. So yeah. Um, all right, timber. I haven't mm. heard of a timber one before. Yeah. Well, let's let's see what the answer is. Okay, Wyoming is home to two species of rattlesnakes: the prairie rattlesnake and the midget faded rattlesnake. And this question is also uh, with the Werner Wildlife Museum. They helped put it together. And so um, just so you know, when we're looking at the slide, uh, the one to the right, the one to the right is the midget faded and the one to the left is the prey rattlesnake. Yeah. So. Yeah, and they can, they can vary a little in coloration, but uh, the midget faded is, blends into sand so well. It's incredible, and it and it's found in the southwest part of the state. That's right. Yeah, where you you know uh, the other rattlesnake you can find generally across the state, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, so neat neat critters. Um, but yeah, they they usually just show up about the time you least expect. Them. Yeah, and definitely when it gets warmer, you know they are more active. A lot mm -hmm. of snakes, so you do want to be aware of that, and mm -hmm. you know looking more towards the exactly. ground yep. or going through grass and yep. not seeing where you're stepping can That's be right. a little bit uh, right. dangerous. So just uh, be aware for well, sure. Thanks everyone for your answers on that. That was a lot of great uh, uh, responses. So. Yeah, it's totally yeah. fine to guess, Don. So, uh, you know, we appreciate yeah. anyone's guesses here tonight. We're not yeah. full experts even, so yeah. yeah, still have a lot to learn. That's for sure. There's always something to learn. That is true. So what's our next category, And you folks? do find them near rocks. I Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a couple of the uh, other Wyoming wildlife, a couple of the low point ones. Um, we can we can just pick one of those Let's questions. Do it. Yeah, do it. You want to do one hundred? Well, you bet. I'm, I might even have a, an answer for that. Oh, so. okay. Okay. What is Wyoming state bird? And here's a special hint. Okay, it's the same as a couple other states, so uh, it's not quite unique, but uh, yeah. it's still a cool bird to see. It okay. has a great song. So okay, uh, what's folks' response out there? Meadowlark. Metalark. You know, there's. Well, yeah. I, okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, with metalark, I think you need to be a little more specific. I think so because right. there's two that I can think of yeah. for metalark, yeah. and, and they're kind of hard to tell apart. You know. Well, and and you know, depending on what side of the state you're on, um, you possibly could very rarely, you, but you could encounter both. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so. that's a really tough thing. I'm a birder, so I, I like birds, but mm -hmm. um, I'm not the best at it for sure. Yeah, so, let's look at the answer. Western metal oh, There he is, singing, singing for all he's worth this time of the year. So Yeah, and this video is also with India Hayford with the Werner Wildlife Museum. The answer is the Western metal it can be seen and heard each summer across the state wherever grasslands and open fields are found. The western meadowlark usually has 10 to 12 songs in its repertoire. 
The Eastern Meadow Lark has a much larger collection of songs with 50 to 100 melodies in their repertoire. And something, if you were curious about the other states, I know you mm -hmm. were dying of curiosity yeah, over what, here, Will. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, what, what are some of the other states? So Kansas, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Oregon. Yeah. So, so, uh, so definitely a very popular bird. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. a nice uh, party fact that you can, wherever you travel to, you can be like, I know this state bird. And exactly. you're ready to go. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, how about uh, how about other Wyoming wildlife for two hundred? Yeah, that's good. And then that's the last one in that category, Will. Yep. And we'll yep. knock it out. Once, what once thought to be extinct species was found near Matisse, Wyoming, in 1981. And so I gave a fun uh, hint here, and I put a little pile of dirt next to the question that you guys may see. Um, when I first showed Will, he was uh, laughing at me a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I thought it was uh, quite cute. Yeah. It was. <laughs> it was. So what? So what? Uh, yeah. So we've got uh, got some folks out there that think uh, a BFF is that best friends forever. Yeah, I think that's us, I, right? I think so. <laughs> right. And then, um, yeah. So let's see what the answer is. On yeah. That. Let's go. Black-footed ferret. Black so it seems ferret. like a lot of you guys are on top of that. You know this species. It's very adorable, as you can see. And it has little black, um, basically, socks on it. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, neat, neat critter. Um, I, I had the uh, an opportunity to work with them at one time. I used to uh, work at our Thorne Williams Wildlife Research Unit. Mm -hmm. And at that time... They were held there in captivity and released out to wow. the wild, and so, yeah, I can tell you, you don't want to put your fingers. That's into right. Their cage yeah, they without, can be yeah. really mad. Yeah. That's yeah. for sure. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. they, they will bite you. They're and, uh, they're, uh, they're pretty tenacious, and those teeth are definitely sharp. So. Yeah, and you know, I know Wyoming Game and Fish Department is doing a lot to help that species specifically. That's right. Yep. Yeah, and and also throughout the West, we're, yes. we're reintroducing ferrets. So, okay, so we've we've closed out the whole uh, other Wyoming wildlife, and, and it seems like people so, really knew those answers. Yeah, so, so good job, everyone. So let's let's uh, let's take a look at another one of those getting schooled. Ooh. How about how about getting schooled for one hundred? One hundred. Okay, okay, that sounds good. What is Wyoming state fish? And I put a picture of it. I know it's a mm -hmm. big hint. But this is a uh, one hundred level question, you, so you couldn't find a better picture of a fish. Than that, so. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, well. Yeah. So, what do we have for? It? What's your guess, folks? <laughs> huh? You got a shout out, Will? There. I did. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Rich. Good. Good to hear from you. <laughs> so I see some other folks I used to work out there, like Steve Checo as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, well, let's see what the answer is. Yep. The cutthroat trout. Cutthroat and trout. we're going to listen to uh, Mike Schmidt from Trout Unlimited. The cutthroat trout. Cutthroat trout in Wyoming can primarily be found in western and northern Wyoming. Awesome. Thanks okay. for that. Yeah. Did yeah. you see how he was uh, in his workshop there yeah. and putting well, together flies? Right, you know? so. right. Yeah, that's uh, an addiction from what I understand. <laughs> so, yeah, fortunately, I that's one of the things I've stayed away from. Okay, tying I my see, own I flies. See. Yeah, let us know yeah. if you like tying your own yeah. flies. We'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, it looks like, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're run, kind of running out of uh, some of the uh, – trivia questions but how about uh, ask a game warden for 300 okay that sounds good yeah. to me ask a game warden 300 what are the age restrictions for operating a boat in wyoming hmm. oh look some people have do tie oh, flies wow. so that's yeah, awesome right. yeah. um yeah that's 
That's, I really, yeah, I appreciate that. You have that. to have a lot of patience and you got to be kind of an artist too. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so we're getting. Uh, we're getting some ages here, oh, whole yeah. range. 16, 12, 16. 16 hmm. plus, that's a unique answer right okay. there. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's probably, yeah. That's a that's a good way to respond. <laughs> well, let's see what our answer is. Yeah, let's check it out. This is Jake Brown. I'm the Tin Sleep Game Warden. I'm here to talk to you about Danger Farm and Operate Watercraft in the state of Wyoming. To operate motorized watercraft, you must be at least 16 years old or be accompanied by an adult of 18 years of age. To operate non-motorized watercraft, you can be any age. To find more information on watercraft safety and regulations, go to the Wyoming Game and Fish website. Thanks again okay. to the Wyoming Game Warden Association. They really helped us out tonight, they don't did. you think? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and that's something you need to make sure that you're aware of if you're a boater and so forth. That you know, you just you know, you, if you got to stand on the seat, you're probably too young to drive. That's you know. Makes sense. Yeah, so. I think we have time for a couple more questions, um, but we'll see if, uh, you know, it's kind of tough to keep track, so maybe we should just pick it, don't you sure. think? Sure. Um, hmm. How about, uh, do you think we did Wyoming Big Game for 500? I don't know. I think we yeah. did that. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, we did not. Just oh, kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a neat one. Um, Wyoming big game for 500. What's the longest mule deer migration documented in Wyoming? Yeah, that's that's something in the last few years as we've been radio calling uh, more and more deer. Um, and with these the newer technologies that store or, or actually send uh, via satellite mm -hmm. animal locations, we're able to learn a lot more about every little step they're taking along the way. On Definitely. Sydney. And, you know, I know with Wyoming Game and Fish Department, we're working a lot to avoid like collisions and stuff that mm -hmm. are across migration pathways. So that's yeah. a really big priority in our the, department. The more we know about where these animals are traveling, <clears throat> the more we learn about the hazards they face mm -hmm. as they're making those tracks. Definitely. Well, it seems like we so, got a bunch of answers. 150 miles, 150 miles. 600 by Pete on Facebook. Ah. Don is thinking 250 yeah. on Facebook. So, um, uh, range mule deer, yeah, whole range, you know, it right. could be anything, right? 500, well, it, yeah, it could be anything. So, let's see what the answer is. Yeah, so for the sublet mule deer herd, the migration is about 150 miles. An outlier, so this one random mule deer or mm -hmm. some few of them, uh migrates about 200 miles and that is information is thanks to jill randall big game migration coordinator with game and fish and she was very helpful giving me that answer yeah. i wasn't even sure 100 yeah. but that's what she does that's what she does every day for us exactly so, so she was able yeah. to get that information and help us out tonight for trivia i think we have time for one more question really quickly if that's okay and we'll go for uh big game for 100. Which of these species are not considered big game in mm. Wyoming? Pronghorn, white-tailed deer, mountain lion, mule deer, elk, bighorn sheep, moose, or mountain goats? It's mm. kind of a tricky question, don't you think? Uh, yeah, it is because uh, it has to do with how we classify animals mm -hmm. legally by statute. So, yeah. Definitely. So, looks like mountain lion... Mountain lion, mountain lion. Okay, people are pretty mm. convinced that they, they think they know the answer. So okay. let's check it out really quick. And you're right. Mountain lions are the correct answer. It's actually considered trophy game, not big game in Wyoming. So I think that's all we have time for for questions for us. Uh, yeah. I really want to thank everyone for joining us, right? Yeah, it's, this has been kind of fun. I've never done anything like this. Melissa has done it before. <laughs> But, I'm not uh, an expert, but Will was a great uh, really, co-host here. Really so really enjoyed seeing really the enjoyed comments it. come in. And yeah, and you guys me. commented so much. Yeah. Don't forget to like. And uh, Catherine yeah. is going to give us some more information. 
Yes, thanks everybody. And Will and Melissa, that was a fabulous job. Um, and it was really fun to see some familiar names. I saw some folks that were with us this morning. Uh, my neighbors, shout out to the bakers. Uh, thanks for being there and commenting. And um, we just really appreciate y'all being here. We have dropped a link to an evaluation in the comment section. So if you could just take a couple minutes and fill that out. We also have this really fun uh, sticker. We talked about cutthroat trout. Well, we have another cutthroat trout sticker um, that also has pronghorn on it. Um, and we would love to mail you and your family that sticker. So um, it's a limited edition and we uh, just need you to fill out that evaluation and give us your address. Uh, we have one more partner to thank, the folks at Onyx Hunt. Um, if you complete the survey next week, we'll send you a special discount code for three months free. Or if you'd like 20% off your subscription, you can enter the code WILD20, W-Y-L-D-20. And not only will you score 20% off, Onyx will also send $5 to the Wild Wildlife Fund. So thanks everyone for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, tomorrow morning is our next event at 10 a.m., Wyoming Scaly and Slimy Critters. So uh, join us tomorrow morning and uh, for more information about Expo or to see our previously recorded events, hit wyomingexpo.com and click on Expo Live. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a good evening, and we'll see you in the morning.